Okay, fantastic. Well, let's continue uh, where we left off. So uh, we've been considering graphs, uh, hyperbolic graphs. And uh, so we introduced this boundary. So gamma here is a hyperbolic graph. Graph, and we introduced this uh, Gromov boundary, which is the equivalence classes classes of infinite geodesics. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so we showed that uh, this gate gives us, uh, uh, it's a topological space. Uh, we, we have uh, the, this gamma bar. So this is gamma union, the boundary, and it's a natural topological space. Uh, gamma sits in here as a dense open subset. And, uh, and if balls are are finite in our hyperbolic graph, then uh, this is a compact space. Uh, and now I mentioned a result earlier when we discussed convergence groups that uh, hyperbolic groups, so remember a group is hyperbolic if it has, a, it's, it's finally generated and its Kähler graph is hyperbolic. Uh, and, uh, and I mentioned that hyperbolic groups are always convergence groups. So let me go ahead and prove that uh, now. So here's the theorem. And this was uh, originally proved by Tukia in 1994. And it just states that, uh, so if gamma is uh, a hyperbolic group, So then the action of gamma on its uh, Gromov boundary, or even the, even the completion, let's say, is, is a convergence, uh, is a convergence action. Of course, it could be an elementary action. Um, uh, for instance, if gamma is the integers or if gamma is finite, uh, well, let me assume it's an infinite group. Uh, it's a, but it could, if gamma is the integers, uh, then it would be, it would still fix points at, at, uh, on the boundary or a pair of points on the boundary. But it, is, but it does show it's a convergence action and then if it's non-elementary, this is if and only if gamma is a non-elementary hyperbolic group. Um, so non-elementary hyperbolic group means it doesn't fix a point or a pair of points on the boundary. So, uh, all right, so uh, let me go ahead and prove this actually. Uh, he proved something a bit stronger, which, which is true for all, um, uh, for all hyperbolic graphs. Uh, Let's see this, how I want to do this. Well, let me just give the proof as I have it written in my notes. So here's the proof. So let's go ahead and take uh, some sequence Tn and gamma uh, such that Tn converges to infinity so it escapes every finite set. And then we need to find two points on the boundary such that uh, off any neighborhood of the first point, everything gets collapsed to any neighborhood of the second point. So we have this north-south dynamics after passing to a subsequence. All right, so we'll go ahead and fix uh, our origin and our group, say the identity element works perfectly fine. And then uh, we'll go ahead and and after passing to a subsequence, generate a subsequence. Uh, let's go ahead and assume that Tn times this origin uh, converges to some uh, element in the boundary. Let me say it converges to some point a in 
the boundary. So it will converge to the boundary because this is an infinite sequence, so it can't uh, converge to some point in the group. Uh, and we'll assume that the inverses also converge. So and T and inverse uh, also converges to some other point in the boundary. Uh, and then I claim that this is the north-south dynamics that we're looking for. So I claim that uh, if you take something which is outside of a neighborhood of B, then the sequence will put it inside any neighborhood of A. So let's go ahead and do that. So remember the neighborhoods of B are given by fix, fixing some R greater than zero. Uh, we consider this neighborhood uh, U of uh, B R, which I introduced last time. So these are, uh, this is the set of uh, points such that there's some geodesic, right? So this was the set of uh, X in gamma bar such that there exists uh, some geodesics alpha and beta with uh, uh, with uh, alpha plus equal x, beta plus equal b, and the limit as n and m tend to infinity of this Gromov product alpha n beta m o should be uh, so the neighborhood we want them to be large so this should be greater than or equal to r. Right, so this is the neighborhood I defined here. So let's go ahead and take something which is not in this neighborhood. So if gamma is not And this, and then we want to find, we want to show that the sequence of TNs eventually push uh, gamma to, um, to A. So uh, what do we go ahead and, uh, so let's go ahead and compute th that. So we want to compute the, so let's go ahead and take, uh, if this is, and alpha is a geodesic, such that alpha plus is equal to A. So then let's go ahead and compute this limit as N and M go to infinity of alpha M and then TK uh, times gamma N. And to say that this is so to say that gamma is close to alpha just means that this should be uh, this limit should be very large so we want to show that as k goes to infinity this limit goes to infinity uh, and to do that we just notice that by the uh, hyperbolicity that this is greater than or equal to the minimum of the Gromov products, we can do the triangle inequality. Uh, so while this is not triangle, it's hyperbolicity. Uh, so this is the lim inf as m tends to infinity of alpha m and then tk times the origin. And then here we have for the lim inf as n approaches to infinity of tk times the origin, and now we have uh, the other one, tk times gamma n. Uh, and we can do this at the cost of delta, well, where deltas are how thin our triangles are. All right, so this is an inequality I believe we proved before. Uh, so now what do we notice here is that this first term 
is just uh, is here we have TKO, which we know converges to alpha, and we have alpha M. Uh, so we know that uh, the TKO X, since it converges to alpha, this will converge to infinity, right? Uh, on, the sec on the other hand, for the second term, uh, we can use that this is, the scrum product is equivariant, so we can rewrite this as O and then gamma N and then TK times O, which remember what this is, we can, uh, so now uh, yeah, here we have, so gamma, so here, let me draw the picture here. So we have, here's our boundary, here's A, here's B. Uh, oh, I wrote down, a, this should be T inverse. TK inverse, right? And gamma, is maybe some point here, this, this uh, gamma. I should have said, so gammas, uh, I should say C, which is represented by gamma. So um, C is not in here and gamma plus is equal to C. All right, so this is C. And then uh, what do we have here? And, and here's our, our origin is, is somewhere in here. So we have TK inverse, uh, is going to be some sequence which converges to B. So TK, TK inverse times O is converging to B. Uh, and then we have O here, which is fixed. And then we have gamma N, which is also uh, con converging uh, to B. And so, um, oh wait, sorry, gamma N converges to C. So here's gamma, gamma N is somewhere out here. And remember what the Gromov product is, the Gromov product, so here we have uh, TK inverse times O, this is roughly equal to B, so we have this like B over here, and then we have some O which is fixed, and then we have some uh, gamma N which is going to C, which is far away from B, which is not equal to B. And what is the Gromov product? So uh, here we're actually just cutting this off a little bit, so we have C way out here, and here is gamma N, and here, here is B, and here is TK inverse times O. And so the Gromov product is exactly this length right here in the triangle, or in this comparison tripod here. So it's this length. And as TK inverse, so as gamma N converges to C, uh, this triple point is not gonna change. But as TK inverse goes to B, this length is going to increase. So that's exactly saying that this sequence right here uh, will go to infinity as k goes to, so the limb I should say here, limb inf, as n goes to infinity. So this goes to infinity as k goes to infinity. And it's also clear from the picture that uh, to estimate the, the how fast it converges to infinity, you just need to know, um, you just need to know the length, you know, here before it diverges, because then what's left over is how fast it converges to infinity. So we see that we can do this uniformly on R. Uh, so hopefully this picture should be somewhat convincing. I haven't been quite as precise as I've been in the last lectures, but uh, that should be somewhat of a convincing picture. So the whole point is that, uh, what do I mean to say is that this converges to infinity, this converges to infinity because it's equal to this, and they both happen uh, uniformly in K as long as we have this controlled by this angle or this uh, distance of the tripod here. So we can do this uniformly in R. We can make it as close as we want. Okay, so that's exactly this, this convergence property. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, so this is a completely general thing. Uh, so the only thing we used about this is we used that we had some sequence uh, in the group gamma such that they converge to, when we apply them to O, they converge to a boundary point and their inverses converge to another boundary point. 
Uh, so these are the only things that we actually used um, about the, so this is a fairly general thing. You could apply this to gen general hyperbolic graphs. Uh, they need not have bounded degree or anything. All you need is a sequence like this and a seek such that this happens. So that's just a remark. One, one question. Mm -hmm. When are we using that C does not belong to the, to this neighborhood? Uh, we're using the cetas, so we need that this angle, so we need that gamma n converges to c. Uh, so that tells us that uh, this length here, so this length here is, is bounded, which means that as we go to b, what's, what's the extra length will be unbounded. Mm. So that's where we use the, that c is different from b. And it's so we so we get uniform convergence based on the bound of this length, but that's exactly this R. Professor, what's the quickest way to see that A is not equal to B? Uh, A uh, is not equal to B or could be equal to B, I suppose. So yeah, yeah, it could be equal to B. All right, other questions? All right, although one, uh, one situation where it's not equal to B is the following. So here's a definition. So if gamma is hyperbolic and we have T is an isometry, acting on gamma. Uh, so then T is loxodromic. If, if the mapping uh, which takes, um, which takes T to the K and sends it to um, T to the K times O. So this is, uh, so T to the K, we'll think of this as inside the integer. So it's the group generated by T. Uh, and we'll want that this is a quasi isometric embedding. Uh, and of course, being a quasi isometric and Embedding in particular means that TK for K positive will map to a different point than TK for K negative. So they'll both map to the boundary and they'll map to different points because otherwise they want to be a quasi isometric embedding. Um, and it turns out for, that for a hyperbolic group, uh, any element of infinite order is loxodromic. So that's a situation where you get that, uh, you know, this A is different than B. You just take any. Uh, element in a hyperbolic group, which is not torsion. Okay, so maybe I'll prove that in a different lecture, but I'm, I'm not going to prove that. Uh, I'm not going to need it, but I do want to do this uh, nice proof. So this nice uh, theorem, uh, which was due to Gromov, which is that, uh, so if T and S, are isometries and gamma. So if these are loxodromic, uh, such that their uh, four uh, boundary limits are distinct. So then for N and M large enough, we have that this group TN, TM, or SM, generated by T and S, um, is a free group, so is free uh, well, it's 
isomorphic to F2, meaning that Tn and Sm are actually free from each other, so they generate the group. And uh, let me call, yeah, and that W, we have a quasi-isometric embedding of the whole free group. And that if we take a W in here and map it to W times O in gamma, this is a quasi-isometric uh, embedding. Uh, in particular, uh, we have a copy of the boundary of F2 uh, that embeds into the boundary of gamma in this case. So whenever we have two loxodromic isometries such that uh, they don't have a common boundary limit. So then we get this embedding of the boundary of F2 into the boundary of this hyperbolic group. And this is nice because this does not assume that balls are finite in gamma. So the boundary of gamma may be highly non-compact. Uh, maybe it's just some Polish space we don't know much about maybe, uh, but we get this embedding and this will even be in an equivariant way if, if you know, this is even in an equivariant way for the with respect to the free group. Uh, we do get this embedding of this compact space into this Polish space. Uh, so this this will be something that's useful and, and I want to use later in the lecture. Uh, in a different lecture. Uh, excuse me, is this yes. all a fixed point or? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. So if you have a quasi-isometric embedding with some O, the, some origin, then it's you replace it with any other and you still have a quasi-isometric embedding. Uh, okay. this, it, it, this is one of the lemmas we proved uh, maybe last week. Um, okay. Because you'll get, uh, you'll get two quasi-geodesics uh, from changing the origin. We'll just give you different quasi-geodesics, which we know are healthy are bounded in Hausdorff distance. So they'll represent the same thing. So they'll, they'll again give you uh, a quasi-isometric embedding. I have another question. When you say that there are four boundary limits are distinct, is looking at these two isometries as those, I guess, kind of paths. Yeah, so by infinite, definition. By infinite paths. Exactly. So by definition, this is a quasi-isometric embedding. So if we just consider K positive, we get a quasi-isometric Ray, which we know is a as bounded Hausdorff distance away from an actual ray, so that's the limit point on the boundary. Okay. Uh, and conversely, if you take k negative, you get a different boundary point, uh, which are is since it's loxodromic, since this is quasi isometric embedding, they're definitely different. Uh, and then the assumption, so you get two for t, and you're going to get two for s. And the assumption in the theorem is that these are four distinct points of the boundary. So they, they don't have a common uh, intersection of these two. Professor, in your definition, you say gamma is hyperbolic. Hyperbolic graph or group? Graph. Graph. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, is a, a hyperbolic graph. And T is an isom isometry. Uh, okay, and it's the same with with the theorem. So this is just a hyperbolic graph uh, with um, these. Things. Okay, so to prove that this is free uh, is actually pretty straightforward. It follows from this argument I just gave you here about this convergence. Because here you'll have, what do we notice here? We just need a TN converges to something, TN inverse converges to something else. And then we get this, this convergence property. And you have, if you have this with T and S, then you can easily set up a ping pong argument. So to get that it's free is actually not so diff difficult. Uh, so this is just ping pong. But to get that as quasi-isometric embedding, which is something I'm going to want uh, later in, in this course. Uh, so you have to be a bit more, uh, it's a bit more difficult 
uh, it's still not so difficult. And, and like I said, this is really a result of, uh, this is a result of Gromov. Uh, but let's go ahead and prove that. So to prove that, I'm going to want to use a lemma. So here's a lemma before the proof. Uh, which is that uh, if gamma is delta hyperbolic, and by that I mean uh, triangles are delta thin, so meaning this grum of if two things map to the same point on the comparison tripod, then their distance is uh, less than delta. Uh, so then, for all O, X, Y, and Z in the graph gamma, uh, we have that the distance from X to Y plus the distance from O to Z is less than or equal to the maximum of the uh, distance, the distance from X to O plus the distance from y to z, and the distance from x to z, plus the distance from y to o, plus two delta. Uh, so what's the picture here? Here we have a qu uh, four points, uh, maybe. Uh, this to illustrate my point. Uh, and here we have um, uh, O, X, Y, Z. And we can draw geodesics. And so what is the saying is if we look at the length of this plus the length of this, well, then it's less than or equal to, uh, oh, sorry, I've drawn it wrong. Um, distance x, y, what is it? So we look at the length of this, uh, this top segment with the length of the bottom segment, then it's less than or equal to either this distance plus this distance, which is obviously not in the picture I've drawn, or this distance in this distance, which it will be in the picture I've, I've drawn. Uh, so in other, in other words, it says that if you take a kind of quadrilaterals like this, the sides can't bow out like this. If they were allowed to bow out, then, then we would see that this wouldn't be possible. Um, so this is the picture that's, that's going on. Uh, so let me go ahead and give a proof of this. It turns out actually that this actually is equivalent to being, so you can go, you can do the converse. You can suppose this holds for all four point, points, and then you can show that triangles are, uh, are maybe four delta thin or something like this. I forget the exact numbers, but this, this character, this is another characterization of hyperbolicity. All right, so let me go ahead and give the proof of this. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and uh, assume that the Gromov product of y, z with respect to O is less than or equal to the Gromov product of x, z uh, with respect to O. Uh, because of course you could replace x and y um, uh, if you switch, if it weren't the case, then you could switch x and y and you would get the same inequality. So I'll go ahead and assume that we have this less than or equal. And then uh, let me draw my picture here again. So here we have O, we have X. I'll draw it a little bit different this time. Y, uh, Z. So here's our points. And we have, uh, we're going to choose geodesic triangles. So we'll let T1, uh, this is going to be a geodesic triangle. Uh, with vertices O, X, and Z. So this is going to be something like this. So this is T1 up here. And then I'm going to let T2 be geodesic 
a triangle uh, with vertices uh, O, Y, and Z. This is T2 down here. And I'll assume that they have the same segment of O and Z. So uh, the, the geodesic from O to Z coincide. All right. And then uh, what am I going to do is I'm going to take B sub Y. So this is going to be in this segment from O to Y. And I'm going to take B Z in this segment from O to Z. Uh, and this is such that they map to the uh, triple point of the comparison tripod for T2. So such that BY and BZ map to the triple point of the comparison tripod. for T2. So that's going to give us some by here, some bz here. So ie the distance from O to by is going to be exactly this yz O. And this is the same as the distance from O to bz. That's what I mean by they map to the triple point. Uh, okay, well, in particular, you have two points of the triangle that map to the same point on the comparison triangle, so we know their distance is at most delta. And then what I'm going to do is I, I'm also going to choose a U. So I'm also going to choose a U here with, again, the same distance. And so we know that then on the comparison tri tripod for uh, T1, because we assumed that uh, this distance is less than this, this distance. That means that U and BZ are gonna get mapped to the same point on the comparison tripod for T1. All right, so we know that BZ, uh, BY and BZ are distance no more than delta and BZ and U are distance no more than delta. So BY and U are distance no more than two delta. Uh, so I'm gonna have to go to the next page to write this out. So. Hopefully we won't uh, lose everything here. You can take a screenshot if you need to. Um, okay, so let me now write out exactly what I mean. So we have, so then, so again, uh, take uh, You know what I wish? So this is good notes doesn't do it. I wish I could just slide it halfway so that I would only lose half a page. Uh, but the app I'm using doesn't allow me to, to only slide halfway. That would be something that it would be nice to have. All right, so let's go ahead and take a U in this segment O to X, such that the distance from O to U is also equal to this um, uh, Y Z naught. So then we get, as I said, we get that this BY and BZ are distance delta, at most delta, and BZ and U. So the distance from BY to U is less than the distance BY to BZ plus distance BZ U, which is less than 2 delta, using the uh, thinness of the triangles. Uh, but what does that mean? So therefore, we can just write this out. The distance from x to y is less than or equal to, we'll use the triangle inequalities, this is the distance from x to u plus the distance from u to by, which we know is bounded by 2 delta, plus the distance from by to y. So there's the triangle inequality there. Uh, and now we can uh, rewrite this as, well, x distance from x to u, u is on the path from o to x, so we can rewrite this as uh, this is the distance from o to x minus the distance from o to u. We still have the plus 2 delta. And then we have, again, by to y. This is on the path, so we can write this as 
uh, the distance from O to Y minus the distance from O to BY. But distance O to U and O to BY, these were both defined to be the same thing and they were just this Gromov pro uh, product. So this is distance O to X plus distance O to Y plus two delta and then minus twice the Gromov product of Y and Z with respect to O which here we can just substitute in this formula. This is nothing but the distance from Y to O plus the distance from Z to O minus the distance from Y to Z. Uh, and now if we move the distance from Y to Z to the other side, we get therefore the distance from X to Y plus the distance from Y to Z is less than or equal to the uh, distance uh, from X to O, distance from X, O to X, and the distances, oh, distance O to Y cancels with distance Y to O, and so we just get uh, plus, uh, oh, sorry, this should be, since I have a we have a negative here, so I want to move this uh, this term over. So that's distance O to Z. And then here is distance Y to Z, and then there's plus two delta. And that's exactly what the lemma wanted to show. Well, remember the lemma showed that it was the maximum of this and something else, but we made this assumption, which, yeah, uh, right, the distance is less than or equal to the max, so we showed it's less than or equal to this one. But of course, that was under this assumption. If this assumption were reversed, then we'd get the other term. Okay, so that's uh, this lemma. And this is, again, another characterization of hyperbolicity, but uh, I won't actually need the converse direction. And now we have the next lemma, which just says uh, if we have a sequence x, j, j goes from one uh, finite or infinite sequence, uh, is a sequence in gamma, gamma hyperbolic, such that the, the condition I want, the distance from x n plus two to x n should be greater than or equal to the maximum of the distance from x n plus two to x n plus one, uh, or the distance from x n plus one to x n, plus two delta plus one. Or again, delta is the thinness of the triangles. Uh, so then, uh, we have that the distance from xn to xp is greater than or equal to the absolute value of n minus p, and this is for all n. So this lemma is useful because it uh, forces things to be quasi-isometric. If you just know uh, from each, every two steps that they're approximately quasi-isometric, so that's what this is saying, that locally, every two steps, it's quasi-isometric. So then you get that it's actually quasi-isometric for the whole sequence. So this is the, uh, what the content of the lemma. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this lemma now. And our proof is gonna be uh, by induction on uh, this difference in minus P. All right, so let's go ahead and first prove it when the difference is equal to one, uh, but that's just gonna be the triangle inequality because uh, what do we have? We have that, um, so of course the distance from x n plus two to x n is certainly less than or equal to the max of the distance x n plus two, x n plus one. Uh, distance x n plus one x n uh, plus the minimum distance x n plus two x n. 
plus 1, plus 1, plus n. That's the triangle inequality. Uh, and hence, if we plug that into star, if we plug this into this formula star up here, uh, we then see that the maximums can cancel. And so we get, therefore, the minimum of the distance between xn plus 2 and xn plus 1 N, uh, is greater than or equal to 2 delta plus 1. All right, that's the so C by star. And that's exactly the k equals 1 case. Right? So, uh, so at least if, if the distance, if the difference between n and p is 1, right, then we get this 1, so this is greater than 1. So, okay. So that proves the base case. So now we'll suppose, uh, so I need to maybe give this formula another star. I'm also gonna have to go on the next page in a moment, unfortunately. Uh, so now we'll suppose that this double star holds whenever, so suppose k is greater than or equal to one and double star holds whenever uh, n minus p, so I guess k will be greater than or equal to, whenever n minus p in absolute value is less than k. And then we're gonna show that it also holds for k. Okay, so in this case, what we're gonna consider is we're gonna consider the previous lemma. So we use delta hyperbolicity from previous lemma uh, applied to the points uh, x n, n, x n plus 2, x n plus 1, and x n plus 1 plus k. So we're going to take these uh, four points and we're going to plug them into this uh, inequality I have right here. And then what this is going to give us, uh, and I really don't want to, well, let me try this. I'll kind of force it to only go over half a page. I could try this before. I'll just copy and paste the whole thing. Uh, so when we do that, so then uh, what do we get? We get that the distance from xn to xn plus 2 plus the distance from xn plus 1 to xn plus 1 plus k is less than or equal to the maximum of the distance between xn and xn plus 1 plus the distance xn plus 2 to xn plus 1 plus k, uh, or the distance from xn to xn plus 1 plus k, plus the distance from xn plus 2 to xn plus 1, all of this plus 2 delta. All right. Uh, but uh, the thing to notice now is um, that this first, so we have a maximum of two things, and uh, we can't have this. If we put in this uh, distance here, then I can't fold. And why is that? So note that the distance from xn to xn plus 2 plus the distance from xn plus 1, xn plus k plus 1. So this is um, greater than or equal to by the induction hypothesis. So here is this distance, uh, or rather, so this first one is by star. 
So here, this I can apply star to the hypothesis. And so this is greater than or equal to uh, the maximum of these two. So certainly it's greater than or equal to d x n x n plus one plus two delta plus one. And the second one, now the difference between n plus one and n plus k plus one is now less than k. Uh, or it's equal, uh, the difference is equal to k. Probably this should be less than or equal to k here. So this is k greater than three. And I'm going to prove for k plus one. And that's what I said earlier. Uh, okay, so now this then follows from induction. So this is distance uh, x n plus two, x n plus k plus one plus one. That's the induction hypothesis. Uh, and so what do we see? We see that this is greater. So now we've, here's the first term here. Here is the second term here. We have a two delta and then we have plus two. So it's greater than if we put here. So therefore what we get is that this can't be the maximum term here because that would give us a contradiction. So this has to be the max, the second term has to be the maximum. And so we get that therefore, the distance from x n to x n plus two plus the distance from x n plus one x n plus one plus k uh, has to be less than or equal to the second term x n x n plus one plus k x n plus two x n plus one plus two delta. But now, uh, what can we do? So this first term, we can use the uh, star for this term. That's x n x n plus two. And so we can say that this first term is, uh, uh, we can put in x n plus two, x n plus one plus one, plus two delta. So plugging that in, uh, we get that, so replacing this by star, I want to cop copy the first, so I want to take this term, I want to say that this term is greater than or equal to, this is maybe a little bit bad board work, uh, but I'll use this is greater than or equal to by condition star, uh, this is greater than or equal to distance x n plus two, x n plus one, plus two delta plus one. Uh, and then we still have the plus x n plus one, x n plus one plus k. Uh, and now we see we get the same term on the left and the right here. So we can drop them and then we get exactly what we want. So we get therefore the distance from xn to xn plus one plus k is greater than or equal to uh, what's left over here is this term. So the distance from xn plus one to xn plus one plus k plus two delta plus one. So we've reduced the degree and we've obtained an extra two delta plus one. Okay, so that finishes uh, this lemma. And having finished this lemma, now the result of Gromov follows quite, quite easily because now, uh, now the proof, so now let me maybe copy down Gromov's. So this is the theorem we want to prove. So now let's give a proof of this. And here's the you know, picture we have here. So we have kind of uh, you know, t infinity here, t minus infinity over here. And here we have another loxodromic element. Here's s infinity 
this minus infinity, and we're assuming that these are all distinct. Um, so this is the, the picture. And what do we know? Well, we know from this uh, convergence property that I proved at the beginning of the lecture, we know that uh, Tn, as n goes to infinity, it's going to collapse the entire space except for T minus infinity, it's gonna collapse it all to T. So it's T infinity, we have this north-south dynamics. Uh, so we can take some neighborhood here, some neighborhood here, and we can move everything outside of this neighborhood into this neighborhood. Uh, so this is what's going on. And similarly, we can do the same thing for S. We can take some neighborhood here, some neighborhood here, and then anything outside of this uh, neighborhood around S infinity, uh, we can move, you know, we can apply powers of S and move it inside this neighborhood. And so what does that mean? Well, we can take neighborhoods of S infinity and T infinity such that this um, is sufficiently large. So the claim is that therefore uh, we can choose uh, uh, for N and M large, we have uh, the following properties. We have that the distance from T to 2N, say plus or minus times O, we'll go ahead and fix O, so O is some fixed point. And for N and M large, we have that the distance from this to O is certainly greater than or equal to the distance from T plus or minus N times O, O plus two delta, plus one. Uh, so why is that true? That's just because this map is a quasi-isometric embedding. So the distance here is roughly twice the distance here. So if it's twice the distance and going to twice the distance and going to infinity, then it's certainly going to be greater than two delta plus one for a large enough n. Right? And similarly, we can ensure that uh, s to the two m plus or minus times O, O is greater than or equal to the distance S uh, plus or minus M times O, O plus two delta plus one. And then because of this sort of convergence, this north-south dynamics, we can also ensure, so these are these facts were just because they were loxodromic, not, nothing else. Uh, but by, by this north-south dynamics, we can also ensure that if we look at t to the plus or minus m uh, o or n. And we look at the distance to s plus or minus m times o, that this uh, will be greater than or equal to the maximum of the distance from t plus or minus uh, n times o to o and d s plus or minus m times o to o plus two delta plus one. And again, why is, why is that the case? That's because um, if we look at, you know, t to the n, it's gonna be somewhere, if we look at t to the n, it's gonna be somewhere over here, it's gonna map everything over here. And if we look at uh, s, s to the m, it's gonna be somewhere over here. And uh, so when we look at the two, the two of these, uh, to travel, to get from one to the other, we're basically gonna have to go through the origin. So, so at some point, the distance here, right? So we have this in the triangle. Right, by hyperbolicity, the triangle connecting them is gonna look something like this. And so the length here is going to be eventually, it's gonna be roughly the sum of the lengths. And so eventually it's gonna be larger than the uh, maximum of these two plus whatever constant we want here. We'll choose two delta plus one. Uh, so then what does this mean? So therefore, if W is any word, 
So we choose N and M such that these are satisfied. And if W is any word uh, such that, or any word in, in T to the N and S to the M. So then what do we see? Well, we see that these three conditions exactly say that we can step-by-step step make this word such that each step uh, we satisfy this inequality here. So then writing, uh, so then we may apply the previous lemma to this word to say any non, any reduced word, uh, to this word to conclude that the distance from W times O to O is greater than or equal to the length of W. Uh, the length in the free group. But on the other hand, of course, this, uh, we always has this less than or equal to the length of the word W, uh, the length here, uh, two times the maximum of just triangle inequality distance from T minus N distance S N O. All right, so that exactly says that this embedding is a quasi uh, is a quasi isometric. So therefore, the embedding uh, taking the group generated by uh, Tm and Sn, or Tn, Sn, and taking a word here and sending it to W times O is a quasi asymmetry. And in particular, you also get that the word is non-trivial. So this is not equal to zero. And so you also get that this is isomorphic to F2. But like I said, that's, that follows really from just the convergence action to get the quasi-isometric embedding is what we used the previous lemma for. Okay, so, uh, so anytime you have a hyperbolic uh, graph and anytime you have uh, this two loxodromic elements without a common boundary point, then you get this embedding in particular. So if, if you have now a group and you have that uh, the group has a Cayley graph that is hyperbolic, even if it's not a finitely generate, com not coming from a finitely generating set. Uh, so if you have a hyperbolic Cayley graph and if there exist two elements of the group which satisfy this condition, then you get that your group contains a free group and you get uh, this embedding of the boundary of the free group into your boundary of your hyperbolic graph. Um, so in particular, well, yeah. All right, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, I, I don't see the first inequality. Uh, you said it's because of quasi-isometry, but it's, yeah. why there's no parameter of quasi-symmetry? Well, that's why we have to pass to the end to get rid of the parameter. So we have that, uh, what do we know from the quasi-isometry? Mm -hmm. We know that the distance from t to 2 to the n times o times o, we know that this is going to be greater than c uh, times 2 to, 2 to the n plus r, and this is greater than or equal to c, uh, 2c, and now we have n here, so it's like 1 over c to the distance from t n times o o plus uh, um, r and then we have plus r, something like this. And now you, um, yeah, so we're going to get something, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, No, I'm not doing it right. So I think the idea is that this distance right here is roughly uh, 2n, and this distance right here is roughly n. 
So if we take this distance minus this distance, we get roughly n. So I'm maybe that's not the inequality I want. I want to just compare, take the difference. T to the 2n times O times O minus E to the T to the n times O times O. Yeah, and so I can say that this is greater than or equal to, and we're going to get something like 1 over C uh, 2n plus uh, minus R and then minus C n plus R. And now you take a limit as c goes to infinity, and you see you go to infinity. I think this is what I want. Oh, OK. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, stop here. And then on, uh, on Friday, we'll do kind of a new topic we'll, we'll discuss quasi cocycles and boundary cohomology a little bit. So that should be fun. All right, so I'll see you guys on Friday.